Okay. So I'm very happy to um, introduce Dr. Peter Kleisch today for this week's uh, Quantum Fluids and Isolation Seminar. So Peter got his bachelor's and master's degree from Ghent University in Belgium. Um, he got his master's in July 2014, and then he got his PhD from Ghent University from 2014 to 2018. Uh, he was a postdoc at Boston University under Anatoly Prokofrakov from 2018 to 2019. And from 2019 to present, he's been a research associate at the University of Cambridge under Professor Austin Law McCraft. He's been a recipient of the Research Foundation Flanders Fellowship and the Belgian American Education Foundation Fellowship. So today he's going to be talking about uh, thermalization scrambling and dual unitary circuit models. So please help me in welcoming either by unmuting yourselves or by clapping virtually, Dr. Peter Kleisch. Okay. Thanks a lot for that nice introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone for attending. And also a special thanks to Joshua again, just for organizing the seminar series. I think it's a really valuable resource. So today I'll be talking about thermalization and scrambling in dual unitary circuit models. It's work I started when I started my postdoc here approximately one year ago in collaboration with Austin Minecraft. And most of it is gonna be based on this one paper which appeared in physical review research. And another one, which is quite timely, should appear on archive next week. So a short disclaimer before I start. This isn't directly related to quantum fluids, but hopefully some of the ideas and some of the concepts should be, if not immediately relevant, and at least interesting to people working on quantum fluids. And also I'm just gonna be talking about general dynamics of isolated models, which I think is of interest to anyone working on quantum many body models. So before I dive in, a brief overview of what I'm gonna be talking about. So I'm gonna first give a general introduction to correlations in many body dynamics. Forgetting about circuit models, just what happens if we have general Hamiltonian and how we can get to effective light cones and thermalizations, which are two general features of unitary many body dynamics. So this part is meant to be pretty introductory, but it's also gonna be pretty hand waving. But then we'll jump to unitary circuit models, show how these encompass all those properties. We can rigorously and easily prove stuff. However, unitary circuit models, they're nice, but they're not we're not able to analytically calculate everything we want to, so we need to jump to dual unitary models, which are a specific, specific class of unitary circuit models. Then, after having exhausted everything I can say about correlations, I'm going to jump to out of time order correlations, kind of moving from thermalization to scrambling, say what we can find there, and then move to conclusions, even if they're not advertised there. So, this is meant to be a pretty introductory talk, so please stop me at any time if you have a question or if anything is unclear. I'll let you know if it's intentionally unclear or if I can explain it. So first, correlations in many body dynamics. The setting that I'm gonna be talking about is one plus one dimensional lattice models. So we have one spatial dimension, which is here just labeled X, and we take a discrete lattice. So any particle can take just a discrete position here labeled zero plus one plus two plus three. And we have the additional dimension, which is gonna be time, because we're gonna be interested in dynamics. We're not just going to be interested in general dynamics, we're interested in unitary dynamics, we're going to be interested in isolated systems, where you know that a Hamiltonian generates time evolution. So we can write the unitary evolution operator u as exponential of minus i times the Hamiltonian times t, where we set h bar equal to 1 just for convenience. And we're not going to be considering any generic Hamiltonian, but we're going to consider a Hamiltonian with local interactions, which can be schematically written in this way. And the Hamiltonian is just a sum of local terms, h i, i plus 1 where each of these is just like a term coupling two neighboring sites. So the Hamiltonian can couple site minus one to site zero. It can couple site zero to site plus one, but it can't couple site minus one to plus one, which is kind of a toy model for general Hamiltonians with just quickly decaying interactions. And this is gonna lead to a lot of fundamental uh, implications, which can be quite generic for any local evolution. So it, we're of course interested in dynamics with just dynamics of operators. We're going to be interested in quantifying operator evolution, where the object of interest is just some time-evolved operator rho, which is going to evolve as u dagger rho u. Now, this can either be some density matrix evolving in time, or some operator evolving in time. It doesn't really matter for what we're trying to do. However, this is quite involved object, so we won't measure it directly. Also, it's not immediately experimentally accessible. So what we're going to do is we're going to indirectly probe it by looking at correlations with local observables. So for example, I have two local observables, rho and sigma, rho acting on site zero, 
which is just choice of label, and in sigma, some other operator in the distance x away. And we're going to be interested in how dynamics introduce correlations between these two. And the correlations functions we're going to use are defined in this way. So we define time evolved rho as done in the previous slide. Then the correlation between rho and sigma, depending on distance x time t, just the trace of time evolved rho times sigma of x. Again, introducing u dagger, trace u dagger rho u sigma. Again, this can be interpreted in different ways. Either rho is the density matrix, then we're basically just looking at the evolution of the observable with respect to the density matrix, or this is just an infinite temperature correlation function between two generic operators. It doesn't really matter, this is just what we're going to be interested in. And one additional note, for simplicity, I'm just going to choose sigma to be traceless. So if the correlations vanish, we can just basically separate this into trace of rho and trace of sigma, then the correlation function is just going to be zero, which is going to massively simplify all coming expressions. Now we can think about what's happening. When do we expect correlations to be zero? When do we expect them to be non-zero? So two limiting cases, consider first short times and two operators that are far away. So x is quite large, t is small. Well, we don't expect any correlations between the two because of the fact that the Hamiltonian is local. We expect the correlations to build up first between site zero and plus one, and one, then site one and two, then site two and three, not immediately between site zero and x. So correlations here are gonna vanish. On the other hand, if you look at small distances, long times, okay, there's no reason it would be zero, and we have time enough for the correlations to build up. So here we expect correlations to be non-zero. And the way you quantify this is by introducing some effective light cone, propagating with some velocity v, and saying that correlations are gonna vanish outside of this light cone, and can generally be non-zero inside of this light cone. Again, this is completely a result of the fact that the Hamiltonian is local. And this can be made rigorous by introducing Lee Robinson bounds, which gives us an upper velocity on the, an upper limit, sorry, on this velocity. And of course, the notion of a light cone is borrowed from special relativity, where the speed of light is of course a bound on the propagation of correlations. But here it's an effective speed limit arising from the interactions in the system. Okay. That's one thing we know when interactions, or sorry, when correlations are going to be zero or non-zero. Then what happens if they're actually non-zero? So now we can just fix x, fix the position, and see how the correlations evolve with time. This is schematically given here. So we have some correlation at some fixed position x, depending on time, we change time. At short times, okay, no correlations because we expect it to fall outside of the light cone. Then some correlations are introduced. We see some oscillations, which are going to be non-generic and indicating some transient behavior. And at long times, and this is kind of remarkable, most correlations between local observables will tend to reach a steady state value. And this is also what's known as thermalization, because generally, if we look at ergodic systems, the steady state value is not just going to be any arbitrary value. It's going to be the thermal value. Namely, we can describe it using a Gibbs state, which is just given as exponential of minus beta times Hamiltonian, which we generally also normalize by the trace. Beta is some inverse temperature. And since we know that energy is conserved, we expect that this Gibbs state should reproduce the correct energy of the initial state, which implicitly fixes this inverse temperature. So we can kind of say, say that at long times, any local system is in thermal equilibrium with its environment, which is just like the rest of the system. Here, of course, I should add, this holds only for system with thermodynamic limit or sufficiently large systems. Because we know evolution is unitary, so we don't expect information to get lost. So if we have a small system at long times, we'd expect revivals. But this is quite what happens here. So the fact that it reaches a constant value is quite remarkable in itself. And this value also allows us to make the connection with classical mechanics and statistical mechanics. So we have this long time value set by a macroscopic conservation law. And classically, the way we think of getting to this final expression is by introducing the notion of ergodicity. That through the dynamics, this initial operator is basically going to explore the full space, phase space that's consistent with this conservation of energy. And if we do this averaging and use some entropic arguments, we can show why this final say state value for the correlations should be the Gibbs value. However, that's one way of getting there. And we get a constant value. Okay, we can have different kinds of thermalization. So the steady state value 
you can either exactly get there without any oscillations or with very strongly suppressed oscillations, which is strong thermalization or mixing. We can also have weak thermalization, where at long times, if we don't go to this constant value, probably John has keep having small oscillations around this thermal value, which is what's known as weak thermalization or a non-mixing system, which is one of the things that can happen. Now we can also go to non-ergodic systems, because basically the Gibbs state only knows about conservation of energy. So if we have other conservation laws in the system, it should also be taken account into the steady state value, because again, their, con their conservation laws, the system can't forget the initial values of these conserved charges. And the way this is then described is by a generalized Gibbs ensemble. Now, these are some nice notions, but how we get there is quite complicated because we can't just do these numerics for an infinite system. Because if we do these simulations, then we run into the problem that there's an exponential wall. Namely, if we have some lattice and we want to calculate these correlations, okay, what we usually do and how we're this being taught in our first course on quantum mechanics, we diagonalize the Hamiltonian, we get its eigenstates, we get its eigenvalues, we just expand this full evolution operator in eigenstates and eigenvalues, and we get okay, some overlaps and some oscillating phases. However, the problem is, if we look at how large the Hilbert space is, the number of states we effectively need in this diagonalization, well, if we have a finite system of L sides, and each side has a local Q dimensional Hilbert space, where, for example, Q equals two, if we're working with spin one and a half or qubits, and then total Hilbert space has dimension Q to the power L. And so even for the smallest possible local Hilbert space too, we can only go to maybe 16 uh, lattice sites, which might be enough to probe some of this behavior, but it's always definitive. So if you want to get something that actually reproduces behavior without needing to, to get, use extensive numerics, we can go to unitary circuit models. And unitary circuit models, as I mentioned before, like these two properties, this, these effective light codes and this thermalization are kind of built in. And we'll show how to get that out of there. So before introducing unitary circuit evolution, we take a brief detour and introduce the graphical notation that I'm going to be using throughout this talk. Because I could write everything down in equations, but that would be extremely unpleasant for both you and me. So the way we do this is by representing vectors or matrices or tensors as diagrams. And diagrams will have a number of legs. The number of legs is kind of the number of indices that we need to specify each element of either the vector, the matrix, or the tensor. An example. Suppose we have a vector. We know that we have one index that's necessary to specify the elements of a vector. So we can just print as a diagram here a circle, which we label V, with one leg coming out, which is the one index which here we label V. If we look into a matrix, we may need two indices to specify each element, a row and a column. So we have two indices here labeled A and B. So matrix M, which is here a rectangle. We can go to general tensors, which have a bunch of indices, however many you like. So we just have something with as many indices coming out as you like. And the main advantage of this graphical notation is that it makes multiplication extremely easy. In this sense, it's just a way of bookkeeping what you multiply and what you need to sum about. Because if we multiply a matrix by a vector, the only thing we're doing is we're taking two of these indices, we're taking them to be equal, and we're sum summing over them. So here, an index is just a leg. So basically, taking indices to be equal and summing over them can just be seen as connecting legs into these diagrams. One more example to make this a bit more specific. Suppose I multiply a matrix by a vector. It's going to give me a vector again, so we need one index, so we expect one leg to be coming out. You can write it in this way, sum over one auxiliary dummy index, MAB times VB. Okay, we have them written out there. We just write them down and we connect a leg. We have summation over this auxiliary leg, this auxiliary index. And now because we don't want to keep track of all these indices, we can just let go of them. And we kind of know what we end up with. Because every index connecting two diagrams is implicitly summed over, whereas every open or unconnected leg is an index that we need to specify ourselves. This is going to be useful now because we're going to be working with unitary circuits with unitary gates. Now, a gate is basically just a tensor acting on two sides, on two copies of local Hilbert space. So we have two legs coming in, two legs coming out. And we're going to be looking at unitary gates. So we have U here represented in this way two legs in, two legs out. And it's Hermitian conjugate, you dagger represented in this way. Now, they're unitary. And I'm going to be making a lot of use of that in the, in the rest of this talk. 
So it's worth it to just see how unitarity is graphically represented. So this is basically multiplying u with u dagger. We're connecting legs. It's multiplying u dagger with u. And this is just a way of representing the identity. To be completely clear, just going to write out the indices for the last time in this talk. So A, B, C, D in each diagram. These are the open legs we need to specify ourselves. Then we have the connecting legs, which I'm just going to label E and F. We're going to implicitly sum over them. And we can just write out the matrix element. So this first diagram, we have sum over E and F, U, A, B, E, F, then U dagger E, F, C, D. Second di diagram is the same. It's with the roles of U dagger and U exchange. You see this is exactly matrix multiplication. Then this identity is because the incoming indices need to be the same as outcoming indices. So each leg like this is simply a Kronecker delta. That's what we get. And now we're going to be considering time evolution generated by these unitary circuits. Rather than cons uh, considering a unitary, it can be written as the exponential of some Hamiltonian. We're going to manually construct these unitary uh, this unitary evolution out of these circuits. The way we're doing this is we're just going to first discretize, discretize time. We can have time step one, two, three, four. And each time step is going to be represented by one layer, like one array of unitary circuits acting on the full lattice, which we can take to be infinite. So if you can see here, first time step, we just add one layer of unitary circuits connecting uh, site minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, and so on. Next time, oh, sorry, next time step, we do the same, but we alternate. So we now connect the lattice sites that weren't connected before. We can keep doing that. So basically, T time steps represents T staggered layers of unitary circuits. And now you immediately see why we need to introduce a graphical notation, because all we're doing is multiplying a lot of matrices with each other, which is a lot of indices to keep track of. Nice thing about this is that it has a light cone baked in. So if you look at the actual evolved operator, u dagger rho u, we can represent it graphically in this way. So just reading from the bottom to the top, we start with one layer of u, of simply evo evolution operator. Then we have the operator rho, which only acts non-trivially on a single site. All the others are just identity. Then we have u dagger, which is simply u but construct out of u dagger. And now we can use the unitarity of the underlying circuits to simplify this. Namely, if we look here, Okay, we're multiplying u dagger with u, which we know has to equal the identity. So we exchange this by the identity. We've removed one pair of gates. But of course, we can keep doing this because the entire first layer, we can get rid of these gates just by using unitarity everywhere, except from the gates that are acting on this one operator row. That's nice. We can keep going because introducing this identity in the first row actually connected some gates in the second row which we can again simplify using unitarity. And if we keep doing that, eventually we end up with something looking like this. So our time evolved operator basically has this hourglass shape, which is nothing less than just this light cone structure. Because everywhere outside of this light cone, if the number of steps away from your origin is larger than your number of time steps, it's just going to act trivially as the identity because you don't have any gates acting on it. Whereas if you're inside of this light cone, then you can get some non-trivial correlations. And you see this here just figure, just graphically, but we can just calculate the correlation function and see if this also holds. And this is what it looks like if we calculate correlations outside of the light cone. So trace u dagger rho u sigma. So we first have sigma acting somewhere outside of the light cone. Then we have our time evolved operator looking like this, which we've already simplified. Then we're taking the trace, which basically boils down to connecting the upper and the lower legs. So this is what we get. We immediately see, just visually, rho and sigma, they're not correlated because there's nothing connecting them. We can just evaluate this diagram. And here we have trace of sigma, because we're just connecting sigma with itself, which is 0. So our correlation vanishes, which is nice. We have a light cone built in. Now, this is 0. But what happens if we want to look at non-zero correlations? So now we're going to see what happens for correlations on the light cone where your number of time steps equals the number, your number of spatial steps. So here now, sigma is just placed on the outer leg of this hourglass shape. We can again simplify this, only using unitarity. Because by introducing this trace, we've effectively connected this lower layer with this upper layer, which is again just connecting u with u dagger, which you can simplify, just identifying them here. OK, OK, 
can remove one pair of gates, and we keep doing this till eventually we end up with a diagram looking something like this. And this is already a massive simplification. If you think of just the massive number of gates we initially had in the full evolution operator, now if you look at the correlations on the light cone, the number of gates is basically two times the number of time steps. And this takes up quite a lot of space for a relatively simple diagram. So we're going to slightly reorder this to get something looking like this. This is the exact same equation as I had on the previous slide, just collapsed into something that's a bit more manageable. And this has very specific structure. Namely, we start from the operator row, and then we have t times this object repeated. Then we contract it again with sigma, the operator that we're interested in the correlation of. And we identify the building block of this correlation, which we call m. We can just write this full correlation function as a trace of rho, then m to the power t sigma. And the advantage is that this only requires the diagonalization of m if we want to evaluate this at arbitrary times. And m, OK, it has two legs coming in, two legs coming out. Each carries a q-dimensional Hilbert space. So this is a q squared times q squared matrix. So thinking of qubits, this is, two, this is a 4 by 4 matrix, which you can diagonalize by hand if you're so inclined. So we can analytically evaluate correlation on the light cone at arbitrary long times. And we can even get some information about the steady state, because this depends on rho times m to the power t. So if m to the power t converges at sufficiently long times, then the steady state simply given by, OK, rho times m to the power t. So there's some hope of getting analytic results on thermalization just looking at this. OK, but that's only on the light cone. Now let's see what happens if you want to go inside of the light cone. And the problem is, if you do the same trick, you can no longer simplify everything. And in fact, the deeper you go inside the light cone, you'll again be faced with this problem of exponential growth. So you need to find some simplifications. And this is where dual unitary circuits come into play. For these, we can get analytic correlations inside of the light cone. So moving on to dual unitary models. In the meanwhile, let me know if there's any questions. So dual unitary models. So far, we've used unitary gates. And dual unitary circuits are gates that are unitary in both time and space, which sounds very fancy and also probably not very meaningful. So let me go into some more detail. So here we have the building blocks of our previous circuits, which is a gate U, it's unitary. And if we think of how this generates evolution in time and space, well, the horizontal legs, if we move one step to the right, it basically corresponds to taking one step in our lattice in the spatial direction. Whereas evolution in time is just generated vertically, just by moving up one layer. Now, if we rotate this by 90 degrees, we basically exchange the role of space and time. If we here take a horizontal step, we move in time. If we take a vertical step, we move in space. So this is some new operator, which is called tilde of u, or the dual of u. If you're interested in the matrix elements, they're just written out here. They're basically just reshuffling the index of your original operator to give you a new operator. And in general, there's no guarantee this is going to have any structure. However, dual unitary circuits are circuits for which these gates are also unitary. Hence, the dual of u is unitary, dual unitarity. So we have unitary evolution in both time and space. And this has really profound implications. Yeah, is there a question? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, it's Anatoly. I just want to, can I ask you a question about the previous slide? You, you said you were welcome. Yes. I was a bit slow. Uh, so, <clears throat> So in, in continuous models, it looks like uh, light cone is exact, right? Because beyond light cone, we have some exponential decay of correlation. Yes. But then, but then I'm, I'm just thinking, so in principle, you can digitize uh, continuum evolution, right? And, and yes. then you'll get exact unitary circuit. But then you just show it it's exact light cone. So where's the no. catch? I cannot figure out. So did, if you want to do this uh, circuit construction, starting from continuous limit, you're basically taking a trotter decomposition. Yes. But then if you want this to be exact, you need to take your epsilon to zero, which also corresponds to taking your time step to, be, to go to zero. So effectively, this velocity here is some upper bound. So you are saying the throttle velocity will be higher than actual light cone velocity. Yes, Same exactly. Point. So the light cone velocity here, it's a ge geometric velocity, which is just an upper bound for the actual velocity you can have in general. So, there, so in the limit of step going to zero, the throttle velocity is infinity, right? Yes, exactly. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. 
And I'm going to come back to this actually because it's a really good remark. Okay, so we have dual unitary gates. We have this, okay. The way we represent dual unitarity, okay, instead of connecting vertical legs, we just connect, connect horizontal legs. So here we just connect all legs to the left, here all, okay, all legs to the right. They need to equal the identity, and we get something looking like this. And you might think this is overly restrictive, but in fact, we found a way of constructing general dual unitary surface for arbitrary local Hilbert space dimension. And the number of free variables you have scales quadratically with your local Hilbert space. So it leaves quite a lot of room to play around in. You can hope to get some generic dynamics from this. And of course, we weren't the first to look into dual unitary models. So a lot of credit should go to these guys, Bruno Bertini, Pavel Kos, and Tomasz Prozen, who initially showed how to calculate correlations in these models. And they actually have a series of follow-up papers on this, and I can definitely recommend all of them. And then there's also work by Saran Krishnan and my co-author Austin Lamcraft, showing how dual unitarity immediately has some profound implications on the entanglement spectrum of these operators. I'm not going to go into it, but it's definitely worth reading if you're interested. So why does this allow us to simplify so much? Well, if you remember, we have this exact light cone from unitarity. Everything here is zero. But then if we rotated everything by 90 degrees, we also know that evolution in space is unitary. So if we do this, we also have a light cone. But the light cone now looks like this. Using dual unitarity, we can show that all correlations outside of this shaded area effectively vanish, so they're exactly zero. And the only part where we can have non-zero correlations is exactly on the light cone. Because here they disappear through unitarity, here they disappear through dual unitarity. So the only non-zero correlations are those on the light cone, which we've just shown you can analytically calculate just by diagonalizing, diagonalizing the small matrix. And now we can see, okay, if you look at different classes of dual unitary circuits, what kind of different dynamics can we get? And First example is I just take some generic dual entire circuit, some local Hilbert space dimension. I take some initial row and I take a lot of random sigmas. I normalize them such that at the time zero, all correlations are one. See how this evolves in time. And we see that every, basically all correlations here decay to zero, which might be slightly disappointing, but it's thermalization. We just thermalize not to a Gibbs state, but an infinite temperature Gibbs state which is a very fancy way of saying, okay, steady state is essentially just the identity. Trace of rho steady state times sigma is just trace sigma equals zero. And this can be easily understood. Because if you think of the Gibbs state, we had a Hamiltonian in there. We had conservation of energy. We had not just conservation of energy, but like a local conservation law, which is crucial in deriving this. Whereas here we have evolution through unitary circuits, which cannot be written as the exponential of some local Hamiltonian. So we've lost this conservation law, which means we have fully ergodic evolution. The system just explores a full Hilbert space and is essentially completely random, which means steady state can only be this trivial state, which means that everything goes to zero. And maybe the way I've presented this is slightly disappointing, but it's already really interesting because usually if we can calculate exact dynamics, the system is not going to be ergodic. General many-body systems, exact dynamics requires integrability, which is highly non-ergodic. So this is kind of interesting. And also we see it's strong thermalization. We go to an exact zero value. There's no oscillations. However, we can play around with it some more. Uh, sorry, let me quickly comment on this. So if you look at long times here for ergodic gates, it doesn't just go to zero, it goes to zero exponentially. And all correlations go to zero with the exact same decay rate, which we can get just from the eigenvalues of this M matrix. Okay. We have strong thermalization, you can also have weak thermalization. You can also find dual unitary circuits, for which long time correlations don't decay. You just keep oscillating around the thermal value. And the interesting thing is also here that we found that the oscillation is, uh, has to be some integer, which is what you kind of get in time crystals for people who are interested in that. Because you can see these unitary circuits also as a periodically driven system. And here, essentially, the correlations respond with some period that is some integer multiple of the period in your circuit, which here happens to be the local dimension of local Hilbert space. That's ergodic, so averaging everything out gives us a zero value. But we can also introduce local conservation laws. We can actually do this in a very systematic way. So say that I want n additional conservation laws, it's n smaller than just your dimension of your local Hilbert space. I can construct some commuting conserved operator, which I call C, C A A equals one to N. 
if I then calculate the correlations, I see, okay, they decay to some constant value, but it's non-zero. We can actually analytically show that here the steady state value is analytically described by a generalized Gibbs ensemble, which means we still have this exponential form. We have all of the conservation laws, all these operators C and the exponent, and each of them has a specific chemical potential mu. Now we normalize it because that's what you do. And again, all of these mu's are fixed by your initial conditions because evaluating your conserved quantities in your steady state should give you the same result as evaluating your conserved quantities in your initial state, which completely fixes this and is completely consistent with the correlations you see here. So you have strong thermalization to a non-thermal value. You can again just introduce oscillations here. We can see that we can introduce oscillations around non-zero values. So we really have a playground of systems where you can analytically calculate all correlations. We can tune them just to give a specific kind of behaviors. So I'm just gonna grab a quick drink. And one final cute example of correlations and hence thermalization is given by pre-thermalization. So we have uh, circuits with conservation laws. We have circuits without conservation laws. <coughs> we can check what happens if we have circuits approximate conservation laws. So we start from some non-ergodic gate and we slightly break these conservation laws with some perturbation of strength epsilon, which we can tune without losing dual entirety. So if epsilon is zero, okay, we get thermalization to a non-zero value, which is the generalized Gibbs ensemble value, the GGE value. Now, if we introduce a small perturbation, well, nothing really seems to happen to the correlations at these times. Like you would expect the effect on the correlations here just to be perturbative. And you could check that, okay, they only deviate with an order of magnitude that's given by the order of magnitude of your perturbation. But we know that something more has to happen because this would implies that it respects the conservation laws. But then if we look at longer times, you can actually see that the effect of this perturbation on long time values is non-perturbative. Namely, if we just keep epsilon zero, we have the non-ergodic gate, we have conservation laws. See, at all times, at long times, it stays at this GGE value. Just notice the logarithmic scale here. Now we can see what happens at long times if you introduce a perturbation. So we introduce small perturbation about 0, 0 0.1. We see at short times, okay, they again correspond up to small deviation, but then at long times, we move away from the GG value to the zero thermal value. And if we decrease the perturbation strength, we see all we're doing is we're extending the time it takes for these correlations to peel off from the GGE value and reach their eventual thermal value. And you can show that this time scales correctly in the perturbation strength. So all correlations first go to a pre thermalization plateau, consists with a non ergodic gate, before eventually reaching, reaching the zero ergodic value. We have a separation of, oh, I see someone raise their hand. Please ask a question. Hey, Peter, I, I was wondering if this this effect that you see there is somehow related with Anatoly's work on uh, the norm of the adiabatic gauge potential and how it changes when you introduce those small perturbations. I think that'd be really interesting to look at, but it's not something we've looked into yet. So I don't know if there's any connection, but I think you probably have a lot of interesting effects once you start looking into gauge potentials in these models. Um, Thanks. Yeah, it's a slightly disappointing answer, but I think it's just going to be interesting to look into. So we have the separation of time scales, and also for people in the audience who are interested in different uh, signatures of thermalization and ergodicity and non-ergodicity, you can also just calculate level spacing statistics for these gates just by taking a small system, say of six sides, constructing the evolution operator for two periods, see what happens there, and we see that okay. For small perturbations, we get the Poisson value, indicating non-ergodic behavior. Whereas at larger perturbation strengths, we move to the Gaussian unitary ensemble value, indicating ergodic behavior. And also, this transition from Poisson to GUE occurs at smaller values of perturbation strength for larger local uh, Hilbert spaces, which is kind of what you expect, because this is really a finite size effect. <coughs> okay, so. That's everything I'm going to say about correlations. So,
momentarily all correlations vanish inside of the light cone. We only have correlations left on the light cone, which somewhat disappointingly on the, also decay to zero in the ergodic case. So at long times, you might expect, OK, nothing interesting going on. The system has lost all information. And this is only true on a local sense, because we can use some more advanced measures for probing this operator evolution to see what happens there. And this brings us to out of time order correlations. So whereas the correlations I've presented so far, they really measure for thermalization for how excitations relax the thermal equilibrium. Out of time order correlations or OTOX are measured for the scrambling of local information. So it's kind of more sensitive or sensitive to something different. So we're again probing the same object, u dagger row u. We have to find time ordered correlation functions, and they're time ordered because if we introduce u in here, we have u dagger row u. So propagation forward in time, backward in time. Makes sense. We can define out of time ordered correlators as the trace of rho evolved in time, sigma, rho evolved in time, sigma. Now, if we would introduce the unitary evolution operator in there, we have u dagger u, u dagger u. So basically, we go forward, backward, forward, backward in time. Hence, out of time order. This has become really popular in recent years as a measure for the scrambling of local information. So how local information gets lost and kind of gets spread out inside this light cone. And it's also connected with quantum chaos, but I'm not really going to go into that. And just one intuitive way of thinking about the difference between these two operators or these two measures. If we take a trace, basically summing over all possible expectation values. So we're looking at some probability distribution. So here we're tracing, taking the average of something. Here we're tracing and we're taking the average of something squared. So it's kind of the difference between a mean and a variance. So the mean can be zero, but the variance can still be non-zero indicating that there's something going on. And so that's what we're gonna do. And for simplicity, we're gonna take the trace of rho squared equal to the trace of sigma squared equal one. Again, just rescaling of operators. This tree really includes any physics, but it's gonna make the coming slides uh, more pleasant to look at. And qualitatively, they kind of behave similar to the correlators. Namely, we have some light cone with some velocity VB, which is known as the butterfly velocity because of the connection with quantum chaos and hence the butterfly effect. And out of the light cone, they're going to take a trivial value equal to one. Inside of the light cone, they're going to take a non-trivial value, which is different from one. And this is where Julian tier starts are really non-generic because generally the butterfly velocity is going to be smaller than the light cone velocity which is in effect generally smaller than this geometrical velocity imposed by the geometry of the circuit. However, in dual their circuits, as I've also mentioned in response to a question, all of these velocities are maximal and coincide. So it's non-generic, but it does make things much easier to calculate. So if we calculate this, and I'm gonna go into details of how we do this later, we get something looking like this. So as of light cone, we have the trivial value. We have some dynamics inside the light cone, Interestingly, inside the light cone, it's not trivial. We see there's some transient behavior near the edges of the light cone, and it seems to reach some steady state value deep inside the light cone. And we can calculate this analytically. Uh, the way we do this, OK, we represent out of time order correlators or OTOX again graphically. So trace rho of t, sigma, rho of t, sigma. Here, graphically, we start from the bottom sigma, u, rho, u dagger, sigma, u, rho, u dagger. We trace, so we connect lower and upper legs. And we can again simplify it using unitarity, first introducing the light cone of rho, then introducing the light cone of sigma. So we've again vastly reduced the number of gates necessary to calculate this. And also, rho and sigma, they're not exactly on the light cone. Sigma is inside of the light cone, and yet we get a non-trivial diagram. So OTOX are not going to vanish trivially inside of the light cone. We can again simplify this diagram to something looking like this. So the specific Labels of this don't really matter, it's just general structure. And I've also folded it so there's another layer, layer of unitary gates hidden behind these. But what we have is very similar structure to what we saw for the actual correlation function. So here we have two copies of rho on the left hand side. On the right hand side, we have two copies of sigma. And in between, we just have something that's being repeated, repeated a number of times, which acts effectively as a transfer matrix. And the number of rows and number of columns is going to be determined by number of space step, spatial steps and number of time steps. That doesn't really matter for what we're doing right now. But we can again take, oh, sorry, we can now take the long time limit and see what happens there, depending on how close we are to the light cone. And 
to, to give you some idea, we're going to be looking at the long time limit, basically what happens to the OTOC along this line. So if you move from outside the light cone to inside of the light cone. Graphically, or you can represent it in this way. So this line now depends on t minus x, where if this is zero, we're on the light cone. This is smaller than zero, we're outside of the light cone. It's positive, we're inside the light cone. Instead of plotting the value of the OTOC, I'm just going to plot the value of the log of its absolute value. So it is going to be zero outside of the light cone. Exactly on the light cone, we can also calculate its long time value. And it takes this value, which is one over q squared minus one, or sorry, minus one. You can get some intuition for this by basically realizing that, okay, we're working with traces operators and they have to be Hermitian. So if you have a local Q dimensional Hilbert space, the total number of Hermitian operators is Q squared. Traceless removes one of them, Q squared minus one. So effectively, this one operator is spread out over all possible trace Hermitian operators. <coughs> and the value minus one you can kind of get from the phase. You can just think about this as some extension of Pauli matrices. Now we can keep moving deeper inside the light cone, see what happens to the OTOC there. And at first, we're going to have some transient behavior, which is going to depend on both the gate and the operator. Then after a while, we see that, OK, there's only going to be exponential decay left. So the OTOC is going to decay to 0, exactly inside the light cone. And it's not going to decay in an arbitrary way. It's again going to decay exponentially. And the really interesting thing is that the exponent we get here for the decay of the OTOC, which measures scrambling, which measures how local information gets lost, is the exact same decay rate that we found for thermalization. Like, how quickly your thermal exc excitations decay to equilibrium, it's exactly the same as how quickly your local information gets lost. So there are basically two aspects of the, the same phenomena here, which really isn't the case generally, where you don't immediately expect a correlation between the behavior of the OTOC and your thermalization. So that's what happens, and I think this bring you a short overview of what we've shown so far. So we've been looking at unitary circuit models for thermalization and scrambling. If you look at operator evolution, look at u dagger rho u, evolves in time, and we immediately see that we have this light cone, which is just imposed by the geometry of the circuit. And if we think of ergodic systems, okay, on the light cone, all correlations are going to decay to zero. So you might expect this to just vanish. However, if you look at the OTOC value, there's a non-zero constant, so there's still something non-trivial going on. Still, if you look inside the light cone, all correlations vanish at all times, but the OTOC goes to zero, it remains focused near the light cone, namely it decays exponentially away from the light cone the moment we move inside. That's kind of the results you can get from dual entire circuits, uh, all of them analytic, which is interesting because usually if you want to do calculations either for many body systems, you need quite involved methods just to be able to look into the dynamics, especially if you want to look into long times, such are necessary to identify pre thermalization If you want to look at general circuit models, you can't get exact analytic results inside the light cone unless you start using random circuits. But here we really didn't require anything to be random. If we want, we could take all of these circuits to be just generic random dual entire circuits. You can also take them all to be the same and can still get analytic results. Just a bit more general than that, I have hoped that I've managed to convince you that unitary circuit models can be used as really useful minimal models for unitary many body evolution, where the locality of Hamiltonian evolution is baked in. And within these unitary circuit mo models, there's a special class of dual unitary models, which can get exact results for termination and scrambling, which are intimately connected here. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. And thanks again to Joshua for organizing this and for allowing me to present. Okay, so well, you have plenty of time for questions. If you have any questions, you can either unmute yourself and just ask it, or you can raise your hand. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, it, it's actually related to the question um, you asked about uh, sort of gauge potential. So we yeah. are now working on, with, with Dries and, and Marcus. So it seems there is a universal way how like, all integrable systems are destroyed, like become ergodic. Mm -hmm. uh, including MBL, actually, which seems like Tamash was right, it doesn't exist. Anyway, so, uh, and what happens is that uh, 
there is like the spectral function, which is basically a Fourier transform of your non-equal time correlation function, which you showed, mm -hmm. develops one over omega tail. And uh, precisely once you go to omega to Heisenberg time, you will see that sort of this gauge potential should ha have exponential scaling. So it explains mm -hmm. log two, everything we found. And so it's, it's probably easy to check because in, in usual models, we are limited to yeah. short times and small system sizes. So it's basically impossible to check. We, we look in directly. So it could be like very interesting to yeah. look at. Well, one, one thing I did re-emphasize here is that with the circuit models, mm -hmm. we're di directly working with thermodynamic limits. And these are yeah. pretty ins insensitive to boundary conditions. If we take a finite system mm -hmm. with boundary conditions, I think all the dynamics on Lightcon are going to look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. As, as long as you stay away from the boundaries. So, yeah, I'm not sure. That's exactly what we are trying to say. Is basically what and what what we see that in the thermodynamic limit, you you, you develop this one over omega dependence on the spectral function, and uh, which actually means logarithmic in time decay of the correlation okay. functions. So it's not like linear. Usually people think it's exponential, whatever. And I just wonder whether it, it, it applies to your system as well. Uh, I would need to think about it. Probably it does, because this is not something I've mentioned, but in one of the works by Bruno Bertini and Paul Post and Thomas Post, they calculate the spectral form factor of a yeah. generic Junter circuit near the kicked Ising model point, which involves some averaging. And there they also found this tail indicating chaotic behavior. But I'm not sure uh, exactly what it's going to give if we do this calculation on this model. Okay. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Uh, any other questions? I have one. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Peter, I, I guess this was uh, one of the intermediate slides. You were talking about uh, these examples. You went from, you know, ergodic to non ergodic, and you yes. show an intermediate case. Can you show that again? Um, Here? I, my question is how, I mean, how does it work? How, how do you choose um, the, or how do you tune these cases? How, how do you choose the gates for, for you know, these intermediate case? Yeah, this so this is something that I've consciously not get into a lot of detail, but it should be on archive next week, is that basically you find a systematic way of constructing these. Mm -hmm. And it's really, easy to just introduce, uh, create a unitary gate law of conservation laws. If I think of really the simplest example, which concerns everything, just use a swap gate, okay. which is strictly dual unitary, which doesn't give any interesting dynamics, we can use it. But then if you add some one side unitaries, you actually kind of destroy some of the conservation laws. So what we've done is we start from a very stupid conserving model, just systematically break conservation laws by adding some random one side unitaries. Oh, cool. And you can parameterize these units as just like exponential i epsilon sum Hermitian matrix. So that epsilon is the epsilon that's being used here. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? Hi. I had a question um, about this uh, long time tail of the OTOC. You said it was exponential, I think. Yes. Exactly. Um, so, but it isn't quite a tail in time. So it's okay, it's kind of hidden here, but it's time at t minus six, which is the distance from the light cone. So we can be looking at very long times, but as long as you stay close to the light cone, this is just going to take the same value. It's really just like probing the profile of the OTOC near the edges of the light cone. So if I remember correctly from some past papers, when they added conservation laws, they saw power law tails in the OTOC. And I was wondering, I think that was for like actual like R random circuits, but with some yes. conservation yes. law. I was wondering what happened here if you added a conservation law to the yeah. exponential factor. Yeah, so the OTOX here really qualitatively different from the ones that you see in R random <laughs> factors. The, we haven't explicitly done this calculation for all, uh, for more general conserved models, which is why the OTOX just focused on the robotic case. But I think we've done one calculation in the kicked Ising model near the point. There we also saw the exponential decay, but to a constant value. But actually, I'm going to quickly reiterate what's happening in random circuits where you have a butterfly velocity, which is smaller than your light cone velocity. 
What you then have away from the light cone is an exponential decay. Rather, you have a diffusively broadening front spraying across the light cone, and then away from that, you have decay as some kind of error function. So this exponential decay that you have here, I don't think it's something you actually see immediately within these high random circuits. So, sorry, so if, uh, so this exponential decay, um, you'll, I assume, wait, you get this for any dual unitary or just the other fully ergodic ones? So this calculates for the fully ergodic ones. And if you, and if you add um, like, like a minimal conservation law, then would you expect it to stay exponential? So what we've seen in the one case where we've done this is that we saw exponential decay, but to a constant value. Oh, I see. I, yeah, I, you have okay. I should mention that the way this was presented is in the opposite chronological way that the papers were written. So we first done this calculation just for general unitary circuits, and we found a way of constructing general unitary circuits with conservation laws. But it's also something we're planning on looking into in more detail. It's also really interesting just to see how everything scales with mm -hmm. your local Hilbert space that I mentioned, which is the one free variable you have in how random circuits. Right. Thanks. Sure. Okay. Uh, any other questions? So maybe I have one uh, slight question. So. I know that a few years ago, um, Grover and Fisher came up with this idea of this quantum disentangled liquid, where basically these heavy degrees of, it's a, be like a true species model with a heavy degree of freedom and a light degree of freedom. And the light degree of freedom would, like to say, like fermion or like boson would localize on the heavy degree of freedom. So it wouldn't thermalize. So wouldn't it be a way of basically better understanding these quantum disentangled liquids, so exploring the physics of these quantum disentangled liquids with unitary circuits. I don't know enough about these liquids to, to be able to give any meaningful answer to that. Okay. Okay. Sorry. So any other uh, questions? Okay, so let's maybe thank uh, Peter again. Thanks for attending and thanks for organizing. Thank you.